Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the daily briefing on the City of Philadelphia's response to COVID-19. Today, the speakers are again joining this briefing virtually in order to adhere to social distancing guidelines. And we're going to begin our briefing with opening remarks from Mayor Jim Kenney. Mayor, you have the floor. Thanks, Mike, and good afternoon, everyone. I want to begin our week by addressing something I observed over the weekend. Saturday, as you know, was a beautiful day. And I know that as the weather breaks, our cabin fever is only going to increase. Believe me, I get it. Under normal circumstances, Philadelphia is the place to be in the spring and getting outside safely for exercise is important for our overall well-being. But I need Philadelphians to hear me out. You've been doing a terrific job staying home for over a month now, and we need to keep that up. We are at a very critical point in this crisis. There may be early signs that we are past the worst of this, but the epidemic, the epidemic could surge back at any point. We are still very vulnerable to a rise in cases, and the only way to prevent it is to continue staying at home unless it's absolutely necessary. If you must go out, wear a mask. Give plenty of space between yourself and others, and wash your hands often. The better we follow the public health guidance, the sooner we will get our lives back to normal. And I want to be very clear that the opposite is also true. Ignoring the guidelines will only prolong our current circumstances. It is on all of us to stay united and to act responsibly to stop the spread. Tomorrow, the U.S. Air Force Thunderbirds and the U.S. Navy Blue Angels will honor frontline COVID-19 responders and essential workers with formation flights over New York City, Newark, Trenton, and Philadelphia. Our formation of six F-16 Fighting Falcon and six F-18 Hornet aircraft will conduct these flyovers as a collaborative salute from the Air Force and from the Navy. The flyover will recognize healthcare workers, first responders, military, and other essential personnel while standing in solidarity with all Americans during the COVID-19 pandemic. Residents along the flight path can expect a few seconds of jet noise as the aircraft pass overhead, along with the sight of 12 beautiful high-performance aircraft flying close in precise formation. The flyover in Philadelphia will start at 2 p.m. and last exactly 20 minutes. Residents will be able to see the flyover from the safety of their homes. We want to remind everyone that if you choose to go outside, you should maintain all social distancing guidelines during this event. We also ask that residents refrain from traveling to landmarks, hospitals, and gathering in large groups to view the flyover. The teams welcome and encourage viewers to tag the flyover on social media with hashtag America Strong. Now I'll turn today's briefing over to Dr. Farley for his daily update. Thank you, Mayor. The uh, situation with the epidemic is looking a little better today with signs of hope that we are past the worst. But as the mayor said, this is no time to relax because the virus can come storming back. Let me give you more details on that. Since this time yesterday, we've had 302 new cases of coronavirus infection reported in Philadelphia residents, bringing us to a total of 12,868 since the beginning of the epidemic. Now we know we get incomplete reporting from laboratories over the weekend, and that includes the numbers today, Still, when we look back over the last couple of weeks, and we look at the cases that as they've occurred in the region, uh, it's looking like we are past the peak of this epidemic, that we are now on the downslope. Now, we're not going down quickly, but the number of daily cases that we're getting seems to be going down on average. So what does it mean when I say we're past the peak? I was asked that question last week, and I don't think I gave her a very full answer, so I'm going to take a few minutes now, if that's okay, to explain what I mean by that and, and its significance. And to do that, I need to go to math, and I apologize for that, for people who don't like math, but it's the way I think about things. This is a number called the reproductive rate. Uh, that's the average number of people that a person with this virus passes the infection onto. And it's written as R with a little zero next to it and pronounces R naught, that's the reproductive rate. If each person with the virus passes this on to, on average, two other people, then the reproductive rate R naught would be 2.0. Now, if that happened across the entire city of Philadelphia, that would mean a very rapidly rising epidemic. And that's what we had in Philadelphia in late March. Now, if that each person on average passed the infection on to 1.2 people, then you would be seeing a slower rising epidemic. Now, if people pass the virus on, on average to less than one person, even slightly less, even 0.99, because some people didn't pass it on to anybody and other people passed it on to say one person, then the number of daily cases declines. And if we can keep, and in that, in that case, the R0 would be less than 1.0. If we have R0 less than 1.0 and it stays there, eventually the epidemic ends. 
So the falling case, case counts that we're seeing right now is a sign that R0 is below 1.0. Our daily case counts are falling. That means that what we're doing is working. It means that people with the infection are spreading the infection on average to less than one person for everyone who has the infection. Now the testing we're doing isn't making, isn't responsible for the success. It's the social distancing that we're doing that's responsible for the success. It's keeping our distance from other people and wearing a mask when we do need to be around other people. So that's really good news. But, but this is really important. We have to keep that R0 below 1.0 for the epidemic to end. So the good news we have today is not a reason for people to go back to the old way of living, just the opposite. It's a reason for us to continue to do what we're doing now. Or to put it another way, in the competition against this virus, we're showing that we can win. But the game isn't over yet, not by a long shot. Still much more we need to do in order to win. So that's what's happening in the community as a whole. Now we're still seeing clusters of this infection in congregate settings where people live together, including nursing homes, behavioral health facilities, and the city's jail. Uh, here's the situation with the city's jail. There are now 68 inmates with a positive test that includes one new positive since yesterday and two others who have recovered have been removed from isolation. We do have to report there are 12 new deaths in Philadelphia residents since this time yesterday reported to us, bringing us to a total of 484 deaths since the beginning of the epidemic. Now, every death is a tragedy. Lower numbers are better than higher numbers. That 12 deaths is lower than we've had in the past, and that's good, but there are delays in reporting of deaths. So we will expect, I would expect some increasing numbers in the future days. Of the people who've died in this epidemic, we know that uh, it's hit particularly hard in nursing homes. 259 of the 484, or 54% were nursing home residents. How's the situation with our city's hospitals? Well, it's looking a little bit better there. In Philadelphia right now, there are 985 uh, patients with coronavirus in the system, in hospital beds. In the Southeast Pennsylvania region, including Philadelphia, there are 1,085. Uh, I'm sorry, that, that's 1,805. Those numbers are slightly lower than uh, where we were on Friday. 33% of our general medical beds and 29% of our intensive care unit beds are available region-wide. Those numbers are a little bit higher than where we were on Friday. So there may be a sign that we're getting past the peak for our hospitalized patients as well. Uh, as far as testing goes, uh, we are pretty much where we were before. We're still limited by the number of swabs we have to collect the samples, our laboratory capacity and delays in reporting. Uh, we're still recommending testing for healthcare workers and people over the age of 50 who have symptoms, but testing is available at an increasing number of sites. Go to our website at philo.gov slash COVID and you can get all the list of expanded sites for testing is available to you. So just to remind everybody again, there's still many cases of this infection here in Philadelphia residents. Uh, many people have the infection and don't even have symptoms. They don't even know it. So you should assume that anyone you meet has the virus. To put it another way, you should assume that you have the virus and may not know it. So you don't want to spread this infection on to your family or your friends or your neighbors or even anybody you meet on the street. So that means follow the recommendations as we said before. Stay home. If you have to get out of the home, keep your distance from people and wear a mask consistently. More information is at philo.gov slash COVID or medical questions, 1-800-722-7112. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Farley. And next, Armando will have the Spanish language translations of the mayor's and Dr. Farley's comments. Mensaje del alcalde Jim Kenny para el lunes 27 de abril del 2020. Buenas tardes a todos. Quiero comenzar el día de hoy con un comentario sobre lo que observé el fin de semana. También vamos a querer disfrutar del buen clima en los parques y plazas. Y créanme, lo entiendo. En circunstancias normales, Filadelfia es una ciudad hermosa en la primavera y también comprendo que salir a hacer ejercicios es importante para nuestro bienestar en general. Pero necesito que todos en Filadelfia escuchen y entiendan. Hemos estado haciendo un excelente trabajo de permanecer en nuestras casas por más de un mes y tenemos que seguir haciéndolo. Estamos en un punto muy crítico de esta crisis. Puede haber señales de que ya hemos pasado lo peor, pero la epidemia podría resurgir en cualquier momento. Aún estamos muy vulnerables a un aumento en los casos y la única forma para prevenirlo es continuar quedándonos en casa. Si hay que salir, por favor debemos usar una máscara, respetar la distancia social de al menos seis pies entre las personas y lavarse las manos con frecuencia. Cuanto mejor sigamos las recomendaciones de los organismos de salud pública, más rápido podremos volver a la normalidad. 
quiero dejar en claro que lo contrario también es cierto. Ignorar estas directrices solo prolongará nuestras circunstancias actuales. Depende de todos nosotros el seguir unidos y actuar responsablemente para detener la propagación del COVID-19 en Filadelfia. Mañana, los Thunderbirds de la Fuerza Aérea y los Blue Angels de la Marina de los Estados Unidos van a honrar a los trabajadores esenciales y al personal de primera respuesta que ha estado en las trincheras combatiendo el COVID-19, sobrevolando las ciudades de Nueva York, Newark, Trenton y Filadelfia con un escuadrón de seis aviones Fighting Falcon F-16 y seis aviones Hornet F-18. Los vuelos son un tributo a los trabajadores de la salud, al personal de primera respuesta, al personal militar y a todo el personal esencial que también nos ayudó con un tributo de solidaridad a todos los estadounidenses durante la pandemia del COVID-19. Los residentes a lo largo de la ruta del vuelo pueden esperar oír unos segundos de ruido a medida que los aviones los sobrevuelan y verán a los 12 aviones militares volando en formación exacta. En Filadelfia, esta actividad comenzará a las 2 de la tarde y durará aproximadamente 20 minutos. Los residentes podrán ver los vuelos desde la seguridad de sus casas. Queremos recordarles a todos que si eligen salir, deben mantener todas las pautas de distanciamiento social durante este evento. También les pedimos a los residentes que se abstengan de reunirse en grupos grandes para ver el paso de los aviones. Alentamos a los espectadores, sin embargo, a tomar fotografías y a compartirlas en las redes sociales utilizando el hashtag America Strong. Y esta es la actualización en materia de salud al día lunes 27 de abril del 2020. Desde ayer se han confirmado 302 nuevos casos de coronavirus en Filadelfia. Actualmente tenemos un total de 12,868 casos en la ciudad. Los datos del fin de semana llegan en lotes y a menudo llegan incompletos. Aún así, estudiando los datos de Filadelfia y los datos de la región, parece que hemos pasado el pico y que se está registrando un descenso real en el número de casos. Esto significa que las medidas que hemos tomado funcionan. La administración de pruebas no reduce el número de casos, pero respetar la orden de permanecer en casa y la distancia social sí han ayudado a mitigar la propagación del virus. Esto no significa que vayamos a volver a comportarnos como lo hacíamos anteriormente y olvidarnos de las medidas de distanciamiento social. Muy por el contrario, esta es una razón para continuar haciendo lo que hemos estado haciendo. En la batalla con el COVID-19, nosotros estamos ganando, pero la competencia aún no ha terminado y seguimos en esta larga carrera. Tenemos que continuar con lo que estamos haciendo para poder ganarla. Tenemos un caso positivo de COVID-19 entre los internos, con un total de 68 casos registrados y dos internos adicionales que se han recuperado satisfactoriamente. Tristemente, también reportamos 12 nuevos fallecimientos en Filadelfia. Hay un total de 484 personas que han muerto por la COVID-19. 259 de estas muertes, o el 54% de ellas, han sido en hogares de ancianos. Este virus no discrimina por raza o por género, y hemos recibido también mejores noticias desde los hospitales. 985 personas han sido hospitalizadas en Filadelfia y 1,085 personas en la región sureste de Pensilvania. 33% de las camas de los hospitales y el 29% en las unidades de cuidado intensivo están aún disponibles en nuestra región. Continúa la limitación en cuanto al número de pruebas disponibles debido tanto a la escasez de isopos para recolectar muestras como a la capacidad que tienen los laboratorios para poder procesarlas. Se recomienda que las pruebas se les den a las personas mayores de 50 años que presenten síntomas. Usted puede encontrar mayor información sobre los centros de pruebas en fiola.gov barra diagonal COVID-19 pestaña FAQ. Y nuevamente, quisiera recalcar que todavía hay muchos casos, hay muchas personas infectadas y hay muchas personas que no saben que están infectadas porque aún no presentan síntomas. Por lo tanto, hay que asumir que todo el mundo a nuestro alrededor tiene el virus, incluyéndonos a nosotros mismos. Y tú no querrás transmitirle la infección a tu familia, a tus amigos, a tus vecinos y a la gente en la calle. Aunque tengas el virus, seas joven y puedas recuperarte, para otros el virus puede ser fatal. Por favor, mantén la distancia social y quédate en casa. Y repito nuevamente, el virus sigue circulando en nuestro ambiente. Si usted debe salir a trabajar o al supermercado, te recomendamos mantener la distancia social de seis pies, usar máscaras de tela en lugares públicos donde sea difícil mantener las medidas de distanciamiento social, lavarse las manos apenas llegue a casa y le invitamos a consultar el sitio web para mayor información. 
www.fila.gov barra diagonal COVID-19. Recuerde usted que puede llamar al 311 si tiene preguntas sobre el COVID-19. Hay servicios de traducción disponible en 100 idiomas. Y si tiene preguntas de carácter médico, puede usted llamar las 24 horas o 7 días por semana al 1-800-722-7112. Y esta llamada es gratuita. Gracias. Thank you, Armando. And now we're going to move to the Q&A portion for members of the media. And I will ask our speakers to, again, join us with their audio and video when they are called on. Please remember that we have limited time during these briefings, so only one representative from each media outlet is permitted, at least for the first round. Reporters are asked to limit their questions to three or fewer, and we will do a second round of questions if time permits. First up today is Pat Loeb of KYW. Thanks, Mike. Um, my first question is for Brian. Um, last week you said that you were reviewing the criteria for, ho for using the hotels for quarantine and isolation space. I wondered if you've finished that review and if so, if it's being implemented and if so, if it's affecting the number of people in the hotels and what that would be all. Sure. So <laughs> let me start with the numbers first. Uh, so we have 93 in the Holiday Inn, uh, individuals in the Holiday Inn right now, and one in the Fairfield. Uh, we have uh, reviewed the protocols, and uh, that effort is really to reduce density within our shelter system specifically. Uh, and so we will be making adjustments to the protocol, which we think will increase the census at the Holiday Inn and the Fairfield. Uh, and by allowing uh, essentially senior citizen, uh, seniors that are currently in congregate settings uh, to quarantine at the Holiday Inn rather than at the shelter itself. Uh, we're also uh, looking at uh, when inmates uh, have nowhere else to go upon their release, uh, of whether it is uh, appropriate uh, at the Holiday Inn as well. Uh, that's not quite finalized. Uh, the delay on implementation has really been around wraparound services uh, <clears throat> there's a final walkthrough today, uh, so we expect that to uh, be implemented tomorrow. Thank you. Um, and then I guess this is for you or the mayor. Um, the Census Bureau says more than half of Americans have responded uh, to the census. However, Philadelphia is the ninth of the 10th largest cities only with only 42% response rate. Does, is that concerning? And do you have any plans to address that? Well, it's certainly concerning for sure. Uh, obviously, we want everyone who lives in Philadelphia to be counted. Uh, I have not heard, this is the first I've heard the 42% number. So we will get some information and get back to you uh, either today or tomorrow with uh, what, what the census folks have in mind uh, to increase that percentage. Thanks. And then um, I know that you're going to introduce a new budget on Friday, but the controller had some numbers today about possible losses. And I just wondered if they were in line with what you are seeing and if you, well, there's the, any- I don't know because the controller doesn't share her information with us. She only shares with reporters. Uh, so if we get a chance to take a look at that. Uh, I know there's been some complaint too about employees getting overcompensated, but I will tell you uh, that um, the people on the front line of this, of this issue police, fire, uh, all of our sanitation workers, every, all the folks who work at the front line of city government deserve dignity, respect, and they deserve to be paid uh, when they're working in a hazardous situation. Uh, and that money was budgeted already uh, in our labor reserve fund. So um, I have no idea what she's talking about. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Next, we go to Denise Clay of The Sun. Hi, my question is for Dr. Farley. Um, you, you said that um, the number of cases are going down now. Um, what are you, I guess, are you still having trouble finding out um, what these um, cases are breaking down in terms of race? Because I want to know if you're seeing decreases in the African American community. Well, our staff has done a really good job in taking the data we have from cases of the coronavirus infection and matching it against other databases to pick up the missing information on race. Mm -hmm. Go onto our website, you can see what information we have on the race on cases, as well as information we have on the race on people who have died from this. Uh, we haven't, uh, the, the dec decrease we're seeing is a very slight decrease. It's not fast at all. I think it's too early to say whether we're seeing more of an increase in one racial group versus another. 
Okay. Now, there's a there's a mobile um, group of people that are doing testing for people who are, in some cases, asymptomatic in the African-American community. Are they giving you their results as well? We get results from any laboratory that does a, a, a test on a Philadelphia resident. So yes, we get those results. Okay. And last but not least, there seem because you know the mayor pointed out that we are experiencing some cabin fever right now. It's starting to get nice out. People want to go outside, but in order to do that safely, there has to be a lot more testing done of the populace. Are I guess are you kind of like are you in the state getting together with whoever you have to get together with to try to get that? testing program put together so that when we are, you know, so that when the, the governor decides that we have gone down far enough in order for us to leave, to, to go out of our houses more often, that we can do the testing and make sure that we don't have to be re-quarantined again? Um, so you're right that we absolutely need to have more testing um, and we are doing everything we can to increase the testing. That means we need to have more of the swabs, more of the little tubes of liquid in it that you use to transport those swabs to the laboratory. The laboratory has to have the ability to test more samples. We need to have a turnaround that's much quicker than several days. We're working on all of those, but it's really slow progress. Uh, we're definitely not there now. I imagine it's going to be weeks before we really are at the level of testing where I feel like it's adequate. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Denise. Sean Walsh of the Inquirer, you're up next. Thanks very much. Um, let me pull up my questions. Um, so more than 30 unions and groups are calling for the mayor to implement protections for essential workers, including expanding testing eligibility to all essential workers and mandating anti-retaliation measures. Is this something that the city is looking into or are you working on that? Uh, let doctor talk about the testing first and then we'll go to the other issues. Well, let me talk about uh, testing. I could more generally about testing asymptomatic people uh, because this comes up a lot. Uh, we know that people can have this infection and not have symptoms, and so it's a reasonable question. But if I could, I just want to talk about it in numbers, because I think that's the best way to, to think about it. So Philadelphia is a city of 1.5 million people. Uh, we have the ability right now to test about 1,500 people per day, which means we test about one in 1,000 people every day. Now, even if we were to expand our testing to 15,000 people a day, that would mean we're still testing one in 100 people in the city per day. So we have to choose who is it we're going to test. Now we can just choose at random, whoever we happen to see, whoever we bump into in the street. But it's probably smarter for us to choose those people for whom the information is most useful. Useful for them and useful for the people around them. So our top priority is gonna be people in nursing homes. Nursing homes is where most of the deaths have occurred. And if we know in nursing homes who has the infection and who doesn't, we can separate out the people with infection from those who don't so that we don't pass the infection from those who are positive to those who are negative. Next would be healthcare workers because people need to go to get health care, and you certainly don't want to get the infection from a healthcare worker who's taking care of you. Then the next people would be those who are more likely to have a serious infection or even a fatal infection. So that would be the elderly or people with symptoms. So that's why we have our criteria for testing. Healthcare workers with symptoms of people over the age of 50 with symptoms. And our staff works with nursing homes and other congregate facilities for that testing. Now, if we started testing young, healthy people uh, who don't have symptoms, We'll find positives, there's no question about it. The question is what you will do with that information. So if I came up with a 30 year old who was positive, uh, what would I tell that person? I'd say, well, stay home, uh, stay away from others, wear a mask if you have to be around others. That's the message you're telling everybody right now. And I'd say, if you're sick, go to the doctor. That's the message you're telling everyone right now. So the information isn't really very useful from anybody for anybody who doesn't have symptoms. Also remember, that uh, the test result is really very temporary. A positive may be negative tomorrow or a negative may be positive tomorrow. So if someone has a negative result, they may feel like they're fine and they may feel like if they have not been following social distancing rules, they don't need to follow it in the future. And that's just the wrong message we wanna send. Everybody needs to follow these rules. So you know, we hope to expand our testing in the future. And if we expand our testing, uh, we can drop our, we can expand our criteria but we're not gonna be at 1.5 million tests every single day in Philadelphia, ever. So we're always gonna to have to have some reason for doing this and we're gonna have it for people for whom the information is most useful. Asymptomatic people would be the last group of people we'd wanna test. And as far as Hahnemann Hospital is concerned, it was on a list, short list of locations as a surge hospital, but early, early on. 
when we review, we had difficulty with the land with the owner. When we reviewed the actual building and the needs of the building, uh, it was way too expensive for us to set up a surge hospital there. Uh, I recognize the building stands at Broad and Vide, and it's a it's a large building, and people see it all the time. But what's inside is unworkable. And what we've done at Leacora Center is stand up a hospital that's getting few patients, thankfully, uh, but is prepared for that surge. So us buying a Hanuman Hospital or eminent domaining Hanuman Hospital or running Hanuman Hospital is not in the stars. It's way too expensive and we've moved it on. And Mayor, on the part of the question about uh, mandating anti-retaliation measures or other non-testing protections for workers? Um, th that I'm not aware of. We talked to our Department of Labor and see what it is they've been working on, but I'm not sure exactly what that means. I guess, are you generally, are you concerned in general of the treatment of uh, non-government essential workers by employers uh, during this time? Yeah, yeah, I, I am, but a lot of people aren't working. So it's, it's, I don't, I, I gotta, I don't have an answer to your question at this moment. This letter just came out this morning uh, or early this afternoon, just an hour or so before the press conference. So we weren't aware of this uh, in advance. Okay. And uh, Mayor, on the Thunderbirds and Blue Angels flyover, uh, you mentioned, you know, the need to practice social distancing while observing that. Uh, given that, um, is this? Do you think this is a good idea? Uh, it, we probably could use the money on something else uh, rather than the personnel and the equipment used, uh, utilized. But I'm not going to turn something which would be positive into a negative. People enjoy the flyover. I love looking at those planes myself. Uh, one, it'll be 20 minutes for one day, and we'll move on. All right. Thank you, Sean. I'm sorry, one, up, one more if you- if, uh, if, You're on, I think, number five, Sean. One, uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll get around, hopefully, to a second round. Jack Tomzik of Metro, you're up next. Uh, yes, uh, this is for Mayor Kenny. Uh, you mentioned the, you know, the nice day on Saturday and the nice weather. Were you unhappy with how people were behaving? Um, in, in general, no. I think people are doing the responsible thing. There are pockets of folks, uh, sometimes young folks, who think it's okay uh, because they feel that they're uh, invincible, um, that they, they, they gather in groups of people. And I've seen people picnicking within, uh, inside the six, six foot rule. Um, and I wish people would, I've seen people picnicking outside the six foot rule. So people just have to be, as I've said many times before, people have to be disciplined and adult and mature about what this is. Uh, and even though you think you're invincible, um, you, your, your parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles are not invincible, especially if they're over a certain age. Um, me being 61, I'm in that age group. So uh, wear a mask and socially distance and save us all. Right. Thank you, Mayor. And this, this uh, question is either for the mayor or for Brian. Uh, Governor Tom Wolf has said the state will allow construction to resume on Friday. Is the same true in Philadelphia or are there tighter restrictions? Um, it's the same in Philadelphia, but I like Dr. Farley about um, what he's reviewed as far as protocols are concerned uh, that align with the state's protocols uh, and that he, we don't do anything unless medical and science folks like Dr. Farley tell us that's okay. So we are uh, looking at the protocol, still looking at them. There may be some uh, small changes that uh, we might want to put in uh, greater restrictions for Philadelphia, but in general, we're supportive of the idea of starting construction if it can be done in a safe way. Okay, and then my last question for Dr. Farley, how many patients are at the Leacor Center? There were four as of early this morning, and I think there were two more scheduled to be admitted. All right, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Jack. Jason Peters of Philly Weekly, you're up. Hello, uh, my first question is for uh, Dr. Farley in reference to the, um, uh, the, the, the formula um, how do you find the value of R not without uh, testing a large section of the populace? Uh, you can't really calculate it directly. You can only sort of infer it based upon what's happening to the daily case counts. So that's why I'm focusing so much on how many cases we have per day. Now we know they fluctuate a lot day to day. So you have to think about kind of an average over time. The fact that average appears to be going down must be a sign that R not is less than one. Okay, got it. Um, another question on Allegheny County's website, they have an expansive breakdown of their testing efforts by demographic and age and so on and so forth. Is Philadelphia considering expanding their uh, public information put out? Uh, I'm not sure what information they have on their website. Uh, no, we are limited by what 
information is on the laboratory test request form. There's very limited information there on race. I don't know what there is on age. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we know more about the positives than we know about the negatives. So you can't necessarily calculate out testing rates by the different demographics. I'll see if there's anything more there that we can put on the website. And if so, we'll be happy to put it out. Got it. And my third question, I suppose the final, uh, I had spoken to a correction officer who tested positive for COVID, who said that there was no contact traffic tracing efforts to be made after his diagnosis. Could you either confirm or elaborate on the contact tracing efforts being made? Um, as far as uh, in the community as a whole, we don't do contact tracing now. We, with uh, 400 plus cases a day, we don't have the ability to follow that up. Now, I, I'm not sure about where this particular worker works, uh, but certainly if there's a lot of things that are taking place in the city's jail to try to prevent spread of the city's jail. Okay, that's my three. All right, thank you, Jason. Michaela Winberg of Billy Penn is up next. Hey, everybody. Um, I think my first question is for Dr. Farley. Um, the CDC, um, as I'm sure you saw, added some new symptoms, uh, some new coronavirus symptoms, things like chills, muscle pain, headaches, sore throat. Um, is the city, are the testing sites run by the city now going to offer tests to people experiencing those other symptoms as opposed to just fever, cough, shortness of breath? You know, we looked at that and had some discussion earlier this morning. I think that we'll have somewhat expanded criteria for what constitutes symptoms. I don't think we want to test everybody who has a headache, and that's one of the items on the list. Uh, but the other symptoms seem uh, like that they could be a sign of uh, coronavirus. And so we'll probably have an expanded view of, of symptoms that we would classify as uh, matching our symptoms. Okay. How, how much do you expect that that would expand eligibility for testing? And I'm also wondering if those guidelines would apply to private testing centers like Jefferson, Penn, Temple, or would it just be the city testing centers that would follow that? You know, the, uh, there are different testing centers run by different organizations and they have their own you know, interpretations uh, and there's a certain flexibility to them. Um, and so uh, I'm not sure exactly how it's gonna play out. I don't think it's gonna make a huge difference. What's gonna make the biggest difference uh, as far as the number of people we test is just how many of the swabs we have and how many uh, tests our laboratories can run. Got it, okay, thank you. Um, and this one is probably for the mayor or for Brian. Um, the administration has previously declined to open more city streets for pedestrians by closing them off to cars. Um, but New York City just added 40 more miles of open streets and West River Drive in Philly has been increasingly crowded. There was a bike collision there over the weekend and an ambulance came. Um, is your position still that it's inequitable or too expensive? And how much would it cost to, to do something like that to close the outer lanes of the parkway or other streets? We're still studying what we can do within reason. And um, I don't know the cost. Maybe Brian has more information. I, I don't know the cost. I think it's it's about what are we trying to accomplish and what goals are we trying to reach? Um, and does closing the outer lanes of the parkway actually create an equitable solution uh, to social distancing? And and frankly, we're, I don't think we, we're sure that it does. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Michaela. Now we go to Natasha Brown of CBS3. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dr. Farley, this question is for you. On Friday, I was asking you about the uh, when we'll know if we reached the peak yet, what will it look like? And you definitely elaborated on that today and gave some glimmer of hope there. Um, how long would you have to see a decline to really even start thinking about the process of reopening this city or this area? So there's going to have to be a lot of changes before we really feel comfortable that um, we're at the end of this epidemic wave. Uh, we want to be able to test enough people to where we feel like we're identifying a good percentage of the cases, not to get them all, but a good percentage of them. And we're gonna to have to have enough contact tracing in place so that when we have a positive test, we can follow up quickly to identify the contacts and take steps so that they don't spread the infection onto others. Uh, and um, 400 plus cases a day, there's no way that we can do that. I said earlier that if we were below 50 cases a day, we might be able to do that. Uh, so we need a greatly expanded testing. We need much more contact tracing. Uh, that's at least two things we're gonna be looking for before we get to that step. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha. Now we go to Claudia Lauer of the AP. Hey, how are you today? Good. I am. I have a couple of questions for clarification. I, I think for Brian, probably. Um, in regards to the, the Holiday Inn and uh, the change of criteria for admission, 
you said seniors in a congregate setting are being considered and that might start as early as tomorrow. That's correct. Um, yes, it's going to take us some time to to um, to fully scale that operation up, um, but it could start as early as tomorrow. OK, so in that, I mean, would you be looking at nursing homes that have a high infection rate as, as places where you might be able to transfer people from or no, so, in, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me let me confirm what I mean by congregate care. So I, we're really looking at our shelter population at this point. Um, so really those, uh, those shelters that cater to the uh, to those without homes. And, um, you know, I think as we look at nursing homes, we're, we're doing our best to provide other supports for those individuals. Um, but I think just, just moving someone that may be in a nursing home, uh, could have, uh, dramatic detrimental effects on their health. Uh, and that is not uh, under consideration right now. Okay. Has the city, um, I'm sure you're aware of the, the vote to strike at the, the South Philly nursing home with the, the uh, have you, has the, the the city talked at all about how to help if the workers do walk out at that facility? Yes. Uh, so we have multiple contingency plans uh, should that happen. Um, and uh, hopefully it doesn't. Uh, I, I know that management and labor were uh, meeting this morning and hopefully uh, those issues will be resolved uh, and uh, and care can continue to be uh, to be provided at St. Monica's. What is your what is your plan? Uh, so we have, uh, we have multiple plans and actually they're not just all surrounding St. Monica's. The first is uh, again, not wanting to disrupt uh, the behavior or to disrupt the healthcare and, and move individuals uh, would be providing additional support uh, within the nursing home itself uh, and, and potentially contract those workers. Uh, the second uh, step would be, uh, you know, if necessary, we have uh, identified space uh, to move individuals to uh, that where we could provide care. Uh, that would be Certainly a last resort, uh, but again, we have uh, we have contingency plans in place to make sure that uh, the folks at St. Monica and any other nursing home that could, that could experience some sort of catastrophic failure, uh, we could take care of uh, take care of those patients. Thank you. Great, thank you, Claudia. And uh, next, we go to Chad Perdelli of Six ABC. Yeah, this message. I mean, this question is for Dr. Farley. Um, Dr. Farley, some believe that the benchmark in Pennsylvania is the most stringent and daunting in the country to reopen. Do you think that may be adjusted or changed? And what would your opinion be on that? Uh, well, you'd have to ask the state whether they want to adjust that. I think uh, it's, as a first blush, it's a reasonable threshold of you know, 50 cases per 100,000. That ends up being about 50 cases per day uh, in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and that's about the number I think at maximum that we could do contact tracing on. So, uh, you know, there, there are many things that, that one would want to take into account, but I don't think it's far off from where we ought to be. And Dr. Farley, what would you tell the people of Philadelphia? Any idea when we may get there at the earliest that you think that we could get to that point you know, if we continue the social distancing? You know, I know this is really tough for people who are cooped up. Uh, and the worst thing about it is the uncertainty. that They don't know when this is going to happen. Uh, and I would love to be able to say, well, it's going to be on this date but I really don't know. I'll just say what I said before. It'll be some number of weeks, but I can't tell them how many weeks it'll be. And some are wondering if maybe to, to calculate the benchmark that cases in nursing homes and the prisons should be backed out uh, just because of the inherent risks there and the confinement and the tough, uh, the, the rapid spread in some of those locations. Do you think that would make sense at all? Uh, I don't think that would make sense, uh, but even if it did, it doesn't make that much difference. The nursing homes are responsible for a high proportion of the fatalities in the city, but they're not responsible for a fairly high proportion of the total cases. Uh, so, you know, that might be, you know, one out of the, the 50 cases per day on average that we would be at in, in uh, some period of time. So uh, I, I think people, uh, they're very enthusiastic about reopening and I understand that, uh, but I think trying to, you know, rejigger the numbers a little bit isn't gonna get us any closer to really solving this crisis. Thank you, doctor. Great, thank you, Chad. Uh, and let's go now to a second round of questions and uh, back is Denise Clay of The Sun. Yes, um, I wanted to find out what the status of the um, contract extension for District Council 33 is. I believe it's still in, in discussion. Um, I don't think we're that far away, but I'd have to get an update from Rich Laser, our Deputy Mayor for Labor. Uh, he's been directly involved in it. Uh, I heard recently that it was close, uh, but not have had a uh, conclusion yet. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Denise. 
Let's go now back to Sean Walsh of the Inquirer. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to get an update on the question I asked last week. Um, last week, you guys said that uh, the only place where the city has offered uh, a nursing home staffing help or any kind of, you know, help because they're their capacity was the Philadelphia nursing home. What's the status of that? And um, are there any other additional nursing homes where the city has aided them either through staff or any other way? Now, there are at least two nursing homes where medical reserve corps staff have gone there and been oriented. I don't know if they've actually started working, uh, but they're prepared to start working. And there may be more than that, but it's, it's not a large number of nursing homes. And that's because they, they ran out of staff or they just had too many cases or what, what triggers? Uh, yeah, all the nursing homes across the city are short on staff. Uh, certainly staff who are testing positive shouldn't come to work. Uh, they often have staffing problems and they rely on staffing agencies. They have limited staff. So all of them are somewhat limited. And so these are nursing homes that were particularly limited and we thought giving them a few volunteers could help out the situation. And what were those facilities? The one was Philadelphia Nursing Home. The other one, I don't remember. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Sean. Uh, let's go now to Kennedy Rose of the Philadelphia Business Journal. Hi, everybody. Thanks for taking the time today. Uh, I know that you've mentioned that you don't have a timeline for reopening, but uh, this is either for the mayor or um, Brian. What's your message for businesses that are currently closed or seeing really short amounts of sales right now? Apply for everything that's available at the federal level, at the city level, and the state level. Um, um, I, I'm I understand their frustration. I'm not, you know, exactly living it because I'm not running a retail business or a restaurant. Uh, but the, the bottom line is if people are not healthy, we could open today uh, and people may not even show up because there's got to be a period of time where they they feel safe going into a, a multiple person setting uh, to eat a meal or to, or to shop. Um, so I, I really have no, no definitive thing to tell them other than we'll get open as soon as it's safe. Uh, and uh, to apply for everything that's available. Okay, and uh, my second question was, what input are you getting from the state right now about how Philadelphia fits into Governor Wolf's vision of a phased reopening? I know Dr. Levine said Friday that she has no idea when the Philadelphia area will reopen, but I'm wondering about the guidance you're getting there. Doctor? Uh, it's the same thing, you know, we're all following the numbers. That's part of the reason why I read the numbers every day. You know, the virus is following its own course uh, and we know that there are many, many cases that we're not diagnosed, diagnosing now. We know there are many cases in the community. It's definitely too early to reopen now. If we did, there's no question. We would get a big surge. It could be much bigger than we had before. Uh, so I can't tell you when we'll be down to safe levels, but I can tell you we're not there now. All righty. Thanks so much. Thanks, Kennedy. And next, uh, we have our final call for questions. Uh, we will go to our last questioner, Jason Peters of the Philadelphia Weekly. Uh, last question. Uh, is there any expansion on convalescent plasma therapy anywhere in Philadelphia? That's no. certainly not for me. So. <laughs> okay. Good. All right. Yeah, that's my question. No, there may be doctors who are testing that out in hospitals across the city. Uh, I don't know that directly. It's something that's very much at a, at a research level and not something okay. that's uh, going to be a broad use. All right, that's all for me. All right, great, thanks. Seeing no further questions, thank you everyone for joining us and we will uh, return tomorrow at 1 p.m. All right, thank you everyone.